Hey there team, it's James here again. Today's topic I know is going to be really, really popular. Lots of you have asked this question in different ways over time in terms of how to use your glutes when running. So that's literally what I want to talk about. Different strategies to get you using your glutes more effective when running, but also different I guess misconceptions which come around the whole sort of topic to do with gluteal retraining and learning to use those all important butt muscles as we run. So I'm going to get straight in there and deal with a few of these misconceptions. So first and foremost it's the idea that we need to spend every moment strengthening our glutes and we get this a lot from you know, physios and chiropractors and osteos and personal trainers and you know, glute retraining and the fact that runners don't use their glutes enough is a very hot topic. It's a very in vogue thing to be talking about and telling runners that they need to do more of. And what I'm saying in terms of saying that strengthening isn't something we need to spend time doing, in, what I mean is not spend time doing in isolation. Okay, strengthening on its own isn't enough. Strengthening is a massively important aspect, but just looking at it as a topic to do with my glutes aren't strong enough, and that's what I need to work on, is kind of only getting very blinkered and only looking at one small part of a quite a broad topic. So what we need to appreciate is the interplay between mobility and strength, and also stability. Sometimes I, even I kind of catch myself using strength and stability interchangeably where they're two very, very different things. So before we get into though talking about stability and talking about strength, because it is an important component, we need to talk about mobility. I spoke about this quite a lot yesterday, which is one of the reasons why I said jump back if you haven't watched it yet and watch yesterday's video. But it's so important to make sure that we have the available range of motion at the hips, or at least we're not stuck in this position where we're quite um, imbalanced around the hips, where our hip flexors are, are tight, our hip flexors are um, in some respects inhibiting our glutes on a neuromuscular kind of reciprocal inhibition kind of way. Because if that's the case, you could do all the strengthening work you like, work through all those various different strengthening exercises, yet you won't re be tapping into the, uh, the, the potential strength that's there th through those gluteal muscles because you're not actually able to get the signal, the kind of the, the connection, if you like, think kind of mind-muscle connection, that neuromuscular link through to actually switch those muscles on. You'll be compensating in different ways and perhaps even reinforcing existing, um, existing imbalances rather than actually starting to address them and undo those imbalances. So we need to, rather than just go straight down the strengthening route, focus on making sure there's adequate range of motion around those glutes and then look at the kinds of exercises that we are trying to employ when it comes to training those glutes. So a lot of the time we'll jump into doing exercises like um, if we're in the gym perhaps exercises like deadlifts and of course you know variations to deadlifts for example we've got in our first day challenge things like, things like a single leg straight leg deadlift um, and various again various different exercises which can be again very glute focused from a kind of a strengthening point of view and using those glutes as a prime mover you know a big powerful muscle to create a big movement something like a high step up or something like a reverse lunge you know even squats again great great uh, examples there are various different squat variations we can use but great examples of more compound based squat uh, compound based glute type exercises but the problem is if you're jumping straight from a position where your glutes aren't engaging and aren't working effectively as a runner and then jumping straight in to do things like squats deadlifts etc lunge variations hoping that that's going to encourage your glutes to work you again as i said a second ago might be playing to existing strengths and and uh, reinforcing imbalances and compensating and starting to perhaps dominate through muscles like your quads instead of actually allowing you to use your glutes. So what I would encourage, and this goes against a little bit of the kind of the, the popular conversation a lot of the time that's had, is to actually break it down to more of your basic activation type exercises, your, your kind of ground-based exercises, almost type Pilates type exercises to begin with. A lot of the time, and I've been guilty of this a lot in the past, um, we kind of want to go more down this functional route straight away. And this functional route is important. And by functional, I mean, you know, we're runners. We want to be 
performing exercises that have some sort of uh, kind of coherent and logical crossover into the action of running. So things like a single leg straight leg deadlift is ideal in this respect because we're standing on one leg, we're having to stabilize, we're weight bearing, all those sorts of things whilst training those glutes makes total sense. But if you skip the part where we actually learn to switch those glute muscles on, you've missed a real fundamental and you've missed the opportunity to actually teach your body how to switch those muscles on before we then put those newly re-educated muscles into a context like something like a single leg straight leg deadlift um, or again squats, regular deadlifts, lunges, all those sorts of things where we're expecting them to work um, as part of more of an integrated system. So as much as the fitness industry has been, uh, you know, a lot of us in the fitness industry have been very keen to be banging the drum about functional exercise, functional exercise, functional exercise over the years, it doesn't mean that there's not a place an important place for actually breaking it down into more isolated, non-functional, if you like, exercises where we learn what it feels like to switch on glute max. We know, we learn what it feels like to switch on glute mead. So for example, lying face down, doing some straight leg raises, really feeling that we're able to do that straight leg raise, lift that leg off the ground using the bigger one of our bum muscles. You know, feeling that we clench our butt and then lift the leg and then release and drop the leg. And we work through a slow controlled set of 10, three times on each side. Or perhaps with glute mead, we're doing our clamshell exercises or our side lying leg raises. And we're learning to switch those on in a really isolated fashion. Again, we can take that isolation into more of a, a then a weight bearing kind of context not out and out functional, but things like our kind of hip drop type exercises off the side of a step. Again, we can take the awareness of what it feels like when we're in our clamshell exercise to switch glute mead on. We can say, okay, I now know what that feels like. And then once we're in our hip drop position on the side of a step, we can use that awareness, use that newfound kind of proprioception in terms of saying, okay, I know now how to at will switch on glute mead and then be successful in that exercise. And then take that into our more functional exercises, our single leg squats, single leg deadlifts, etc, etc. But without that initial phase where we're learning in more of an isolated fashion, more of a focused fashion, how to switch on the right muscles, you're less likely, in my opinion, to be able to actually get the, um, the, the specific firing pattern, the specific activation pattern out of those bigger compound exercises, squats, deadlifts, lunges, all those sorts of things that so often we jump to when it comes to strengthening. So that's a really important aspect. So now within our download, again, I've added a few example exercises to cover the isolation side of things, the functional side of things, and the mobility side of things, just to give you a flavor of the sorts of exercises I'm talking about. So don't forget, do check that out, do download that. There's no email to exchange. There's obviously that to pay for it, nothing like that. Um, it's a free download to support what we're saying as part of this, um, this, whole, this whole conversation. Now, the third aspect, the third element is, I think, the kind of the icing on the cake. You can be doing all the activation work, all the strengthening work, and believe it or not, I see this fairly frequently and have seen this fairly frequently over the last decade or so working with runners, that they do all the right work yet they're not getting the transfer in terms of strength, stability, or even glute activation. Let's forget strength and stability in terms of different traits. They're not able to switch on their butt muscles as they're running because technique is letting them down somewhat. I mentioned this, or I kind of alluded to this a little bit in yesterday's workshop where we were talking about the position of the pelvis and the way in which the position of the pelvis affects our ability to actually engage our glutes. If we're running around in a position where we're ever so slightly forward tilted through the pelvis, it feels, if anything, kind of like we're slightly forward pitched through the torso and kind of like we're sticking our butt out as we're running. Okay, if you can picture that, if you, again, I know some of you from, from doing workshops, I know there are plenty of people out there who, when asked, do you ever feel when you start to get tired that you just kind of sink, sag, or you feel like you kind of stick your butt out as you're running? There are usually plenty of hands that go up. That, a lot of the time, comes from a little bit of a lack of strength endurance in terms of those extensors, being able to hold us upright for a long time, 
but also forward tilt of the pelvis as we start to succumb to perhaps either a little bit of tightness through anterior, uh, anterior hips, so think hip flexors in particular, also weakness through your core. But either way, if we fall forwards into that anterior tilt, it gets harder for us to be able to actually switch on those butt muscles and be able to use them effectively as we're running. So what we can do is apply simple little cues to try and get you to hold your hips slightly higher up and forwards over the top of the landing foot. Cues like gently drawing the belly button in as you're running. So again, kind of beginning to revisit the Pilates world a little bit, some, some cues in terms of beginning to switch on some of those lower abdominal muscles. Straight away, create a little bit more control through that lower core region and help you hold that pelvis in a slightly more controlled position. I'm not even going to say neutral position, but controlled position, which will usually feel like you're lifting up through the hips and holding your hips slightly higher as you're running. And it's not the height in inverted commas that has the effect there, it's actually the positioning of the pelvis. And what happens is we get back into a bit more of a controlled position, you should find it's easier to begin to actually switch those butt muscles on as you're running. And it should feel slightly stronger underfoot and if anything slightly lighter underfoot, rather than feeling like you're kind of sinking and creating these longer, heavier strides that come with the tendency to overstride that comes with that forward kind of forward tilted posture and that anteriorly tilted pelvis. Now, all these things are interlinked. Um, I specifically want to talk about the, the next part of this, I specifically want to talk a little bit about cadence as well. Because as we start to drop forwards into this anterior tilt, we start to overstride, a lot of one one aspect that comes hand in hand with that a lot of the time is that cadence starts to take a bit of a drop south. So if you feel yourself starting to slow down in terms of leg speed, another thing that you can work on is continue to make short, quick strides and focus on keeping your, your cadence nice and high because that again will help you keep those hips that little bit higher and allow you to get back into a position where you're able to actually switch those glutes on a little bit more effectively. So the next aspect when it comes to technique is to actually think about not just the standing leg, but also the swinging leg. A lot of people have a tendency to run around with a fairly low carriage of the foot, fairly low carriage of the knee. And believe it or not, it's actually this swinging leg as it's coming forwards into flexion that can have a real effect on the opposite leg as it's driving back into extension. The two legs as we're running work in opposition, left, right, left, right, working in opposite directions, but they're not working in isolation of each other. They're not working as two separate sides of the body, they're working as two parts of one unified machine. And as we're driving forwards on the swinging leg, so the knees coming forwards, getting you ready to create the next stride, come down, strike the ground. As we're coming through that swing phase, there's a, a kind of a deep rooted reflex called the cross extensor reflex, which if harnessed effectively, will actually help you create a little bit more extension out of the back end of the stride on the other side. Now, a lot of the time when we are running around with a fairly low shuffle of the low shuffling gait and kind of low carriage of the foot, low carriage of the knee, we're not really getting much out of this reflex. We're not really getting enough hip flexion on the side that's swinging through and knee flexion on the side that's swinging through to actually have an impact on how well we're able to use those extensors on the opposite side. So to talk about the cross extensor reflex very briefly, very um, simplistically, it's to say that on one side, so let's say the right hand side, if I drive my knee forwards, so I'm coming up into hip flexion, that increased amount of flexion or increased um, flex, uh, kind of flexor activity on this side is going to have the opposite, uh, it's going to kind of instigate the opposite effect on the opposite side. So it's going to create more extension or more extensor activity on the opposite side. So as I'm running along, if I want to get a little bit more out of my glutes on my, let's say my left hand side, rather than consciously thinking about squeezing my butt, and particularly on my left hand side and trying to you know, consciously make those muscles fire, it all happens way too quick to make that actually happen consciously. The best thing that you can do is to actually think about driving through forwards with the knee on the opposite side. And I would encourage you not to think about this as one side in isolation, otherwise you're gonna start running in a very weird manner, but instead doing this with both legs. 
and thinking about as you're running along ever so slightly lifting the knee a little bit more ever so slightly lifting the foot a little bit more now if you do this and you have a tendency as well to um, increase your cadence at the same time it may be that you just find all of a sudden you're increasing the pace and you're finding that your heart and lungs have to try and keep up there is a degree of subtlety here Okay, and most people try and, and overdo this too much, too soon, uh, and over-exaggerate the movement. What we should be after is to actually get to a point where it's a very subtle change to form you're making. So first and foremost, you're thinking about drawing your belly button in, holding your hips high, and making sure that you're not, you're not forcing short, quick steps, but you are aware that you're keeping your cadence just high enough for it to feel nice and crispy underfoot, nice and responsive underfoot. Again, for different people at different paces, an optimal cadence is a kind of a, a, moving, a moving target, if you like. So I don't want to just stand here and say 180 steps per minute, because I feel like that's not really, you know, it's, it's not going to be as true for someone who's running 11 minute miles as it is for someone who's running seven minute miles. You know, that's, it's very much a variable, not a constant. But your cadence should be quick enough for it to feel responsive underfoot. And then from there, think about just lifting that foot that little bit more, thinking about driving the knee through that little bit more, and that in itself should start to feel like it creates that little bit more of a drive out of the out of the back end side without having to think about it a little bit more. By back end side, what I mean is that, that stance leg, the leg that's really propelling you off. Okay, so you've got those two legs working in opposition and focusing on those little tweaks to technique can be all it takes to then get the crossover from the, the strength that you're finding in the gym, the strength that you're benefiting from through going through things like 30 day challenge, doing your home workouts, all those sorts of things, and taking that and putting it, your body in a position where technique wise, you're able to actually use that strength on the run. We can think about what kinds of techniques, what kind of drills will really help you when it comes to starting to actually engage those glutes through some of the, the, um, the, the kind of the techniques we were talking about when it comes to lifting the foot that little bit more, driving the knee forwards that little bit more. Simple and classic kind of running drills, things like your A march, A skips, B march, B skips, those sorts of things would be well worth starting to go down the route of and having a look at. Again, I'll make sure that there are some details there in the, uh, the, the PDF, the bonus download, so check that out but also something as simple as adding a little bit more targeted hill running into your week. And I'm not talking about all of a sudden finding time for an extra session in your week. Perhaps you're in the middle of a marathon program and finding extra time for another session of the week is completely unrealistic. It'd be too hard on your body forgetting your diary um, as much as anything else. So instead, what you can do is start to add in a few sets of strides, either on the flat, which is one thing, but strides up a moderate hill doing kind of 30 seconds times five or six at the end of a session or at the end of a warm-up before your main session, depending on the type of session you're doing, would be a great way to start to actually train your body to start driving through that little bit more with that knee coming forwards, pushing you into hip flexion and starting to pick your feet up a little bit more. Because of the way, when we're running uphill, each stride is ever so slightly higher than the previous. You naturally have to lift your knee up that little bit more, lift your foot up that little bit more, so you don't catch your toe on the ground as you come through. Far more effective than the running on the flat. And again, a great thing about running uphill is it stops you from overstriding. You can't overstride effectively um, when you're running uphill. Oh, it's very hard to overstride when you're running uphill in comparison to running on the flat. So it encourages you to actually promote good running mechanics. So well worth a look. Anyway, I'd love to know what you have been working on in terms of running form. Love to know what kind of successes you've had in terms of being able to actually go from a place where the physio said you're not using your butt muscles, you're not using your glutes, to perhaps a place where you can feel that you're actually beginning to engage them a little bit more effectively. You can feel hopefully stronger on the run. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your experiences. So in the comments down below this, let me know what you're, let me know what you're feeling. Let me know what you've been, uh, what you've been experiencing. Let me know what you've been working on.